Hey everybody, hope you're doing good today. It is the day after Easter, April 1st, 2024, and welcome to the morning devotion. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5 today, so if you do have your Bible, open up there. Um, I came to understand so much just through reading the Bible. Uh, so, you know, I never grew up opening up uh, a, a Bible. Uh, never. That was kind of a foreign thing. I just, it wasn't a part of my world. I remember maybe as a kid looking in a bookshelf and seeing something called the Bible. Um, uh, I think a lot of families might have had a Bible around. Um, but as far as like opening it up and learning about it, Man, that's just not was not one of my my things anyway. You know, we had different prophets, you know, different people that we looked up to. And I'm sure you do too. No matter what your background is, you have some prophet, priest, pastor, someone in your life. You might call them different names. You might call them a uh, political activist. You might call them a uh, university professor. Uh, yet they serve the same purpose. They are your people of authority, the people that you are trusting. You know, Jesus was awesome. And, uh, you know, you read about Jesus and he was so different, right? And he talks about him being the ultimate authority and uh, to trust in him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Not your professor, not the political activist, but Jesus. You know, he says he can do something far greater for you than your professor and uh, or that political activist. And that's his claim. You should check it out. And uh, that's why I literally just go through the Bible in my devotions. It's just my devotion time. It's a time to get in the Word in the morning. I invite anybody to come in with me as well, which is awesome. It's great to see Mike. Hey, great to see you yesterday too. Mike and Bob and Patty. And I got to give a shout out to Patty Farmer and Jim. Man, they were unbelievable yesterday. Man, just super awesome. Hey, Jim, shout out to you, brother. That was awesome, man. You you stayed uh, you stayed and hung with me for the whole show, almost, man. It was awesome. I think you did. Um, you know, not too many people do that. Usually, I I tend to get up early and get there early, and then I stay late. And uh, man, you were you were on the you were on it, and it was great to see you and P Patty there just serving with an awesome heart. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate that a ton. So Isaiah chapter 5, let's kind of get into it. Now, the last chapter was cool because we found out something kind of interesting, and that was there was this idea, hey, Tina, what's happening? Tina, another one who just, man, he just goes the distance in serving. Love it. Tina, thanks so much. Paula, what's happening? You better catch up on YouTube. So chapter 4 was cool because we had the introduction of the branch, if you remember. And that was interesting. We want to underline that because we we have seen that there's these hints of this, uh, who this child's going to be that's going to wreck Satan. And remember, page two of the Bible talks about that. There's this child that's going to be born of a woman that's going to wreck Satan's and and crush Satan. And we keep getting glimpses of what who this person's going to be, uh, what tribe they're from. They're going to be called the arm of the Lord. Um, it's going to be like the hand of God, the outstretched arm. It's going to be the work, the deliverance of, of the Lord, of Yahweh. Um, and we see that Yahweh's presence has gone away from the earth. It's distant, right? Very distant. So much so where people cry out. Even, even Israel cries out, where are you? We saw that in the Psalms. That's the cry. In the prophets, we're getting more detail into what this strong arm of the Lord is, the hand of God, the deliverance of God, what this is going to look like. And we get this idea in Isaiah 4 called the branch. That's a biggie. Because we're going to see in a latter prophet, actually the branch is going to be um, identified as a person of that particular time, a guy named Joshua, which is really interesting. The branch, Joshua, hmm, 
There are some interesting things there. Uh, so Jesus, his name is Joshua, by the way. Yahshua. So that's the interesting thing, is that the branch is going to be revealed even by name in the Old Testament. That is cool, right? So chapter 5, it says, this is a song about the Lord's vineyard. So it's a song, and it's cool. We went through the Psalms, and now we see other songs that are in the Bible. And this is a song that's in the Prophets. And it says, now I will sing to the one I love a song about his vineyard. Hmm, this is a love song. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. Taking care of things, right? That's the idea. Am I a person who takes care of things, prepares it? You know, uh, there was one of the uh, gentleman that was going to be helping out uh, to prepare for our Easter services. And he was gardening before he stopped by the fellowship. And, you know, that he probably knows about this. Preparing the fertile, getting the land plowed, clearing its stones, right? To plant the best of crop. And it says in the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. So he built a watchtower to be able to view things, to see things, to, to watch out for things, I guess. And he, he carved a wine press, right? And it says, and he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes. So watching, waiting, the hard work working farmers first to partake of the crop and he's waiting for that harvest right i mean sweet grapes they're pretty cool right nothing's wrong with the sweet grape and it says but the grapes grew that grew were bitter now you people of jerusalem and judah you judge between me and my vineyard what more could i have done for my vineyard that i have not already done <clears throat> You know, it says in the New Testament, as much as it depends on Bo, or you, to live at peace with all people. You know, think of this question. What more could I have done? What more could I have done to be at peace with people? What more could I have done to reach out? What more could I have done to make rec reconciliation? You know, what more could I have done? Not so much looking at the other person but what could i have done that's the question that's proposed right to jerusalem and judah hey here's the song i've prepared this beautiful place i've made this beautiful wine press i've wa i've gr i've planted this beautiful crop it grew though really bitter and you know, think about it. The root of bitterness, right, that the New Testament talks about. Is that in me? Have I grown bitter? You know? And what have I done? Have I gone the distance to deal with things? So I see a couple applications there, right? You know, God saying, what more could I have done? You know, going the distance. Do I do that? Or am I like Judah and Jerusalem where I just grow bitter? day by day, resentful, you know, mad at someone. Oh, you did this, you did this, blah, blah, blah. You know, instead of talking to them, you know, whenever you talk to someone, you always get the uh, a different idea, right? It's funny. You talk to one person, you might think one thing. You talk to another person, you get another thing, you know, and your mind opens up. Whoa, that wasn't the way I thought it was. And da, 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 da. And, oh my God, I thought you said this and you didn't say that. And oh man, I misunderstood you. And you know, how many times have you or I misunderstood others? Probably a lot, <laughs> right? And probably a lot. And man, that, that shows that maybe when we think we know, you know, maybe, you know, especially in relational settings, maybe we don't know too well, you know, maybe we do have to take a break, take a a little back seat and say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe I need to reach out, you know, 
Or if you feel that bitterness coming on, maybe I need to deal with that bitterness properly. Not allow this bitterness to get the best, you know, of me. You know, develop into a strong resentment. It says this vineyard grew really bitter, right? And then it says, uh, when I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? That was the end of verse 4. It says, now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and I will let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. Mm, it's going it's to be taken down. I will make it a wild place. It says, where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with byers, or briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to not drop rain on it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. Wow, what an interesting title for God, right? The Lord of heaven's armies. We've seen that before, by the way, but it's just neat that it comes back. Hey, God's going to... Yeah, you know, you, you know, again, the the hero of the Bible should be Israel, right? It's the history of Israel, but it's interesting how the Bible is always, you know, there's no favoritism with God. Whoever it is that goes against God will be judged, whether it's Israel, who God's given much grace and mercy to, or the other nations. And here, you see in the prophet. The first prophet that we're in, Isaiah, all of the judgment first goes to who? Israel and Judah. Judgment begins where? Right in the house of God, right? Right first, right there. God does not show favorites, and I need to remember that today. It says that the nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. Man, God by grace chose him, right? By grace. And it says he expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. Hmm, that's sad. And it says, what sorrow for you to buy up a house after house and field after field. Now think of this with the United States. If you could just think of this section that I'm going to read with us. Let me know what you think it's talking about. Okay. It says, what sorrow for you who buy up house after house and field after field until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land. But I have heard the Lord's heaven's armies swear a solemn oath. Many houses will stand deserted. Even beautiful mansions will be empty. Ten acres of vineyard will not produce even six gallons of wine. Ten baskets of seed will not yield only one basket of grain. Interesting. You know, you who build and build and build and build, take up more land, take up more land, you think it's going to pay off. You think it's going to produce. And God says, nope, it is. You're going to one day. It is. Those houses are going to be deserted one day. Right. That city, that land is not going to produce anything. Right. And even though you have 10 baskets of seed, you're only going to get one basket out of it. Diminishing the law of diminishing returns sets in, right? You keep building your, you, you keep doing it, oh, building more, 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 more. And it just, it's tearing down and tearing down and tearing down. Oh, man. Isn't that interesting? You know, maybe that's what I've grown up in. Is just, you know... Of course, I grew up, you know, close to what, 12 million people, you know, in my Southern California area. And, you know, it's just constant urbanization, just constant, you know, there's city, then there's urban life, right? And just apartment after apartment after apartment. I remember, you know, when I left my my father to 
you know, just live on my own at 17. And, uh, and then, you know, then, uh, my girlfriend and I, uh, you know, getting together and finding places. It was apartment after apartment, after apartment, after apartment we can go to. There was a billion apartment structures, right? There's so many houses. There's so much, right? Building, building, people making money and money and money and more and more and more. It's just constant. It just doesn't end, man. It just goes on and on. And you think, you know, the United States is gnarly. Man, take a peek at some of those other areas, those Asian cities, cities, right? You know, Hong Kong, you know, things like that. And you look at them and you're like, wow, talk about incredible structures, right? Field after field, house after house, you know, especially the house after house part, part, you know? Yeah. So it makes me think like, boy, maybe when we get to heaven, you know, what What we have, haven't even thought of as being sinful and wrong and missing the mark. You know, I think, you know, our eyes might be open just to a brief second before God's wonderful grace rushes in, right, and, and blesses us. But he'll give us that moment just to see everything clearly for a moment of just how far off we have become and it'll just be a revelation like no other you know and uh for a moment we might feel undone absolutely undone and then boom grace hits his love comes in right and helps us oh man Woo, that's that would be gnarly I'm not saying that's going to happen, but boy, I could see that happening, <laughs> you know. And it says, what sorrow for those who get up early in the morning looking for a drink of alcohol and spend long evenings drinking wine to make themselves flaming drunk. They furnish wine and lovely music at their grand parties, lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, but they never think about the Lord or notice what is what he is doing, right? Constantly just doing your party life, doing your club life, right? Doing your thing of having a drink, hitting the social structure, the social places of your life, right? And really, you know, you just, that's what your life's about is just the bottle, right? Man, I can't wait to drink. I can't wait to drink. I can't, you know, it's like, you know, that kind of idea, that kind of, um, you know, addiction in a way, but maybe not an addiction. Maybe it's like a working addiction, meaning it seems to function okay, right? You go to parties, you're part of the grand party stuff, right? But you just don't think about the Lord. That's where Israel, that's where Jerusalem and Judah that's what they're into, just like us, just like a society like us. They're into entertainment. That's where, they, where it's at. So many people go into exile far away because they do not know me. Those who are great and honored will starve, and the common people will die of thirst. The grave is licking its lips in anticipation, opening its mouth wide. Judgment is right there, but you have no clue. What a great picture, right? It's I love that. Grave is licking its lips in anticipation, opening its mouth wide. Wow, man, that's crazy. And it says, the great and the lowly will all, and all the drunken mob will be swallowed up. By what? By this judgment. Humanity will be destroyed and people brought down. Even the arrogant will lower their eyes in humiliation. There's going to come a time of humbling. You know, and this is true. This is scientifically a fact. Everybody will be humbled. There's no doubt about it, you know. And, uh, you know, to understand that now and to be able to, again, focus on the Lord, to be able to say, hey, hey okay, maybe I need to think about God. Maybe I, I shouldn't push God away anymore. Maybe I should actually start to, like, investigate a little bit of who this Jesus guy really is. Not so much what the YouTuber says, not so much what this other person says on TikTok, but maybe just opening up the book and reading it. You know, that's what I had to finally come to, you know, is that understanding. Because all of us will be humbled. But the Lord of heaven's armies will be exalted by his justice. God will exalt his righteousness. This is a theme throughout the scriptures. 
that when God comes on the scene, he will exalt his righteousness. And if God is going to glorify, shine, value his righteousness, there's going to be a judgment on all who is not righteous, or else he's no longer just and he's no longer righteous. So if you if you want God to be less than righteous, then you're asking for just a human being to be your God. But if you're asking for the God, the true and living God to be God, which he is God, then he is going to be just and righteous. And that means there is going to be a judgment on all that is not, right? So it is, is it rightful for God to ju- judge? Yeah. Can ju- God judge the way he wants? Absolutely. He is the righteous judge. That's right. He is holy. It says the holiness of God will be displayed by his righteousness. God will demonstrate his holiness by his judgment on what? Sin and sinners. That's right. The only time we get upset about this idea is when we don't think that we're really sinners, but we actually have mistaken ourselves as being holy. And when we think of ourselves as holy and righteous and just, what we've done is we've taken what is rightfully God's attributes, righteousness, justice, and holiness, and we've put them on ourselves, and we've actually mistaken ourselves to be God. And we think we are just righteous and holy and all that, and we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Yeah, and that's what we've done in our world, right? And that's why a lot of people get upset at God's judgment, and why I did too, why I got upset at it. Oh, man, God wouldn't judge me. What kind of God is that, man? What kind of God would send someone to hell? What kind of God? All those things, I was mixed with that kind of idea, that I was the one who was just, and I was the one who's righteous, and I'm the one who didn't need uh, humbling. You know, I had it together. See, I had it totally mistaken. I was blinded. I could not see my own yuck, my own sin, my own lack of justice, righteousness, and holiness. So it says, though, in that day, the lambs will find good pastures and fatted sheep and young goats will feed among the ruins. Man, they're going to have a field day. It says, what sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. Wow, interesting. Who drag sin behind them, right? It just It's constantly with them. That's it. It's constantly with them. Right? They no no need for God, but their sin is right there with them, always at their side. It says they drag it into their cars, they put it everywhere. It's in their cart. <laughs> it's in their shopping cart. It says they even mock God and say, Hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan, for we want to know what it is. Oh yeah? They still go to God and go, oh, yeah, if God's real, why doesn't God do his thing? See, this is just like me, just like how I was, right? If God's real, why doesn't God show up on the scene? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God show himself? Oh, Oh, I, I'm looking, you know, mocking, just that mocking of God, right? That lack of humiliation, constant mocking. What sorrow for those who say w- that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark. Hmm, does this sound like our world a little bit? Does it sound like maybe how I've been before? Even maybe how I am today? That what is evil is good and good is evil? Can I even call uh, things that I do evil? Am I okay with that? Or am I still thinking too proudly of myself where I can't even have a good assessment of things that maybe I do that aren't right, that I need to change too? The people of Judah and Jerusalem during the time of Isaiah, so many of them are just in rebellion. They just mock God. They mock the prophet, right? They mock people that open up their Bibles and read it, right? They make fun of them, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's God going to do now? You know, let the Holy One carry out his plan kind of idea. Oh, yeah. We'll see what he does. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. So verse 21 says, What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. Man, this is, oh, chapter 5 is definitely my teenage years for sure. 
right? How much alcohol, boasting in that. Oh man, I could drink so much. Watch this, right? This is a good college. If you're in college, this is a good chapter for you. It says they take brides and let the wicked go free. And they punish the innocent, right? The innocent people get bullied, get punished, right? There's bribes that go around, right? The wicked go free. I mean, look at the last four years. Has there, I mean, has anybody thought anything wrong with what happened? You know, is anybody in jail for any of the incredible overreaching that was done? The wrong behavior, the wrong things said, even though we have it all on video, right? Of what people said and the the wrong things that were said, there there's no ramification for that. There's only ramifications if they really if the people of power structures really want to go after someone. That's how it works. If people of power really want to invest their time into going after whoever, then they will go after them. But those that they don't want to go after, they won't. That's how it works, right? That's how power structures go. A lot of favorites. It's interesting. God shows no favorites, but humans, we tend to what? Show favoritism, mm. right? We might treat our kids way different than we treat other people, right? We might let people go free, and then we judge other people harshly. Mm. See, we're all out of whack, right? And it says, therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will not will rot and their flowers wither. Mm, man. For they have rejected the law of God of heaven's armies and they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. What a good prayer. God, help me not despise your holy word, right? Let me not despise it. Let me not hate it. Let me just admit to it. Go, yes, that's right. You're right. You're righteous. You're just. You're holy. Man, I'm the one that's off. You know, I need to hear your word because you're right. I'm wrong. You know, kind of attitude. That's where I need to kind of get it, you know. So it says, this is why the Lord's anger burns against his people and why he has raised his fist to crush them. I mean, this is his people. Very clear, right? God is going to what? Crush them. His people people you know no favorites the mountains tremble and the corpses of the people litter the streets like garbage but even then the lord's anger is not satisfied that's it god's wrath can it be satisfied in his judgment i mean what's going to satisfy the lord's wrath against sin and sinners he will send a signal to distant nations far away and whistle to those at the ends of the earth. They will come racing towards Jerusalem. They will not get tired or stu uh, stumble. They will not stop for rest or sleep, nor a belt to be loose, nor a sandal strap broken. Their arrows will be sharp and their, and their bows ready for battle. Sparks will fly from their horses' hooves and the heels of their chariots will spin like a whirlwind. They will roar like lions, like the strongest of lions, growling. They will pounce on their victims and carry them off, and no one will be there to rescue them. They will roar over the victims on that day of destruction like the roaring of a sea. If someone looks across the land, only darkness and distress will be seen. Even the light will be darkened by clouds. God says he's going to send a signal to the distant nations far away, and they will come, and they will be God's hand of judgment on the nation on Judah and on Jerusalem. That's specifically within the context. Judah and Jerusalem will be judged by a, a nation. And it says nations, distant nations will be coming and will be God's instrument of judgment on this area. So man, some really, really sobering ideas in this chapter. One to read again, very New Testament in many ways. To walk humbly with a God with God, right? To God resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble kind of ideas. Um, not to mock God. God, you know, um, you know, the scriptures tell us in the New Testament that, you know, not to mock God, right? 
uh, whatever a person uh, sows, that he will reap, right? And so we don't want to mock the Lord. We don't want to despise, right, God's word. So a lot of things that you see that are referenced in the New Testament are taken out of this section of Isaiah chapter 5. So pretty cool. Anyway, a lot of good stuff. Patty says, good message for the day after Easter. His blood has cleansed us. In his death, we have been made righteous in him. We are the vine on God's tree. Do not grow bitter in this wicked world. Stay humble and be of God's witness to all those lost like Israel. And it says, Israel was. Thank you, Bo. Hey, right on. Thank you, Patty, for that. Appreciate that. And that's a good summary of what we just read. And I love the idea of that, you know, always bringing it back to the Lord, right? What God has done, what Jesus has done, he has appeased the wrath of the Father. Man, amen for that, right? Um, You know, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each have gone their own way, but he has laid on him, right? On the branch, the iniquity of us all, right? Wow. Interesting. So he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And by his wounds, we are healed. So it's definitely cool to think about that. So great chapter. Good to review. You guys have a good day. It's going to be, it looks like another rainy one. I was hoping to get on the motorcycle, but right now, mm, doesn't look like it. So you guys take care. Bye-bye.